Hello from Bethesda. So this is your first makeup lecture for the week. And um, I'm going to start out with announcements just like I typically do. So if you're on Blackboard, uh, you would have already um, gotten this announcement, but I did post quiz six. And you can get to quiz six, six by just clicking on this link. So quiz six will pop up. And uh, as a reminder, that's due to me um, by the end of the week. And that is on the material from last week. So, um, so you should be good to go, except for we do have a couple of slides left to finish up that I'll start off with um, right now, actually. And so that's due by five on Friday. That way you can take off and enjoy your spring break. Um, other things, let's take a look at the schedule real quick. So, uh, so I'm going to lecture now on 7-2, which is uh, another section on confidence intervals. Uh, this time it is on confidence intervals for the mean, but when we don't know our population standard deviation, so when we don't know sigma, and that is a pretty typical situation. So uh, you will definitely need to know how to do this one. And then the next lecture, which my guess based on my travel schedule will probably be posted Thursday, uh, but you will get an announcement uh, when that is up for you to view. So, uh, so just scheduling wise, probably Thursday. And then finally, uh, homework is due um, Wednesday. Uh, if you guys need any extra time, just shoot me an email. I can be lenient on that one. You guys do have a, a little bit extra time, but I also don't want you to have to work on it over your spring break. So, so try to get it done. Some other stuff coming up is you have project proposals due uh, March 28th. So you've got a couple of weeks for that, but you should uh, already be talking to uh, fellow classmates and trying to identify at least one to two other partners. Um, my experience with the projects is that uh, if you get three people and come up with three research questions to tie together, they tend to be a little bit more interesting. Um, so I would challenge you to uh, really think about that. So that is the schedule. Uh, we are going to start off uh, with the end of section 17, a couple of slides, and then we will pick up um, actually a decision tree to show you, and then we'll start into uh, section 72. So that is the plan. Uh, video lectures, so feel free to pause and uh, come back whenever you want. So, uh, Section 7.3, I had left off and we had gone through and constructed confidence intervals for proportions. And we had ended and I did not quite get to so slide 35 where I was talking about um, calculating sample sizes so for study design. And so similarly uh, with our um, study design for a mean, if you're interested in estimating a proportion and you're planning ahead, you're going to want to know um, what kind of sample size you need to collect, collect for a certain level of precision. And uh, so sample size for proportions pertains to this. When we have a formula, again, it's essentially you take your confidence interval, you figure out what level of precision you want. That's our E, so right here our E and you solve for that from your confidence interval, and then here's our formula. So with an estimate of P, um, an estimate of Q, let's see, uh, our critical value, so how much confidence do you want? Uh, what is your level of precision you want to be estimating within? And then this formula will give you a, the sample size that you would need. Okay, the one thing that's a little odd is that, so you're going to estimate sample, um, you're going to estimate your proportion with a sample, but you're using a proportion here in that estimation. Um, so if there's no prior evidence that you'd actually know what that proportion is, uh, we use the worst case scenario. So this is common. Uh, so if you don't have a prior estimate for your proportion for study planning, so from a pilot study say, then you use a P of a half. Right? So that, that ends up giving you the largest sample that you would have to collect. So again, worst case scenario. 
So as an example, uh, let's say we want to uh, estimate the true proportion of college students who do laundry once a week, and we want to be precise within 3.5%, and we want to be 99% confident. And let's say we had a previous study or maybe another study at another university that said that that proportion was around 75%. Right, so I am wanting to know how large a sample, so that tells me I am estimating sample size, so I need one of my n formulas. Um, this is a proportion, so that tells me which one to use. So that is this formula right here. Uh, I can get my Z, so that would be using a 99% confidence, I would get my critical value. So you can check yourself with that. You should be able to use your table to come up with a 2.575, 2.58. Um, I had a prior estimate for P at 0.75, so I plugged that in. Q is then 1 minus P, so that's why this is a 0.25. And then I wanted to be precise to within 3.5%. Right, so when you put this into your formula, make sure you denote that in terms of a, a proportion. Okay, so 3.5% is actually 0.035. Right, so that'll be important. That would make a big difference. And planning all of that out, if you put that in your calculator, and then again, you can pause to check yourself. But you should get a little bit over 1,014, um, so always round up. So you would need to collect a sample of 1,015 college students. So that would allow you to estimate the true proportion within 3.5% with 99% confidence. So that's one, one example. Um, so another example. And I would encourage you to pause and see what you can do with this. So I've got a researcher. They want to estimate the proportion of executives who own a car phone. Oh, that sounds old. Um, and she wants to be 90% confident and be accurate within 5% of the true proportion. Find the minimum sample size necessary. Right, so again, I'm estimating a proportion. I want to figure out sample size, so that tells me that I need to use this formula. And I know my E, I can figure out my Z. Um, I'm not giving P and Q, so worst case scenario then is to use a P of a half. Right, so I'm gonna ask you to then pause that and see what you can figure out. Okay, so I'm trusting that you did that, but let's see what we can get. So if I have P of a half, and so I'm going to take half, I'm going to multiply it times a half again, and then I need to figure out what my Z is. All right, so I'm gonna pull up my Z table. Let's see. And I need the other side of my Z table. So my confidence level was what? 90%. So 90%, which means I would have 5% in each tail. So if I'm looking that up, that means I am finding the Z value that has 5% above it and 95% below it. So that value is going to be right around here. And uh, I am going to, so I could average in between here, but let's round up uh, since that's what your homework has you do. So 1.65. So that is going to be my critical value. So 1.65 and then I have um, accuracy within 5%, so that's 0.05, and then I am going to need to square that. Right, so I am calculating that. That's what I want, so 0.5 times 0.5, and then times 1.65 times 1.65 
divided by 0 0.05 divided by 0 0.05. So I'm going to get 272.25, which you would then round up to 273. Right, so putting all of those together, that is what I get. So worst case scenario, that's why I have the 0.5 as my P. Um, 1.65 is my Z critical value. Um, I want to be within 5%, so that's where the 0.05 came from. So when you went through all of those calculations, you should come up with rounding up that you would need a sample size of 273. And that's it. So that will get you um, sample size needed for proportions. And again, the big thing is if you don't have an estimate of that proportion, um, worst case scenario, just use um, a half, and that will give you the largest sample size that you can need. And that wraps up section 7.3. All right, I'm going to go back to our Blackboard screen and um, show you where to get a couple of other pieces that you're going to need for the rest of the, this particular video lecture. Um, so if you go into your Lectures tab, and you'll notice, um, so I will post the video link here, um, but uh, obviously I'm recording it right now, so the slides are right here, so you can get to that, and then I also went ahead and put up the T-table if you want to pull down an electronic copy to use. Um, but first, I was going to show you a decision tree that might help. Uh, we're going to start learning a variety of tests and confidence intervals, and it can be easy to get lost a bit in this, so this might help. And right now, we've covered a little bit of this. Um, by the end of the semester, we're going to have covered all of it. And the um, purpose of this is to help you think through what table to use. And um, when you start learning the formulas, you could even perhaps start filling in what the formulas are that correspond to the different tests. Um, but starting at the top, uh, so you want to ask yourself for the problem you're looking at, uh, does it pertain to a mean or does it pertain to a proportion? If it pertains to a proportion, so that's going over here to, um, to the right, and then the next thing is you're going to want to ask yourself, are you looking at one population or two populations? And so far, the only thing we've talked about is one population. Okay, so here we have taken a single sample from a single population, and we're interested in estimating its proportion. So single, and then we've come down, and we've learned how to do a confidence interval then for a population proportion. Um, we will uh, also learn how to compare two, so two proportions. So we'll learn this branch over here. Um, and then if it were a problem that pertained to a mean, so again, you're going to want to ask yourself, does this uh, correspond to one population or two populations? And so far, we have only looked at one population. So we have a sample from one population, and we're interested in estimating its mean. So come down here. Um, do you know the population standard deviation? Right, so section uh, 7.1 was yes, we know sigma. Right? When we know sigma, we can use the Z table. Uh, section 7.2, which is what we're about to get into, uh, is the situation where we don't know our population standard deviation. So no. And um, when that is the case, then we are going to use what's called a T table to construct our confidence interval. And that is the major deciding factor. Do you use a C or a T? And the answer to that is do you know your population standard deviation? If it's yes, it's a Z. If it's a no, it's a T. Right? And then the procedures are exactly the same. Interpretation is the same. Right? So that's, that's the crucial decision point. Um, but we will go through and learn all of these other ones as well. Um, so far we've learned confidence intervals, but we'll add on tests. Um, one thing that I, you might want to think about is as you start putting together your projects, is these are all of the situations that we're going to learn about. So comparing uh, two populations on a mean, two populations on a proportion, 
comparing a single population uh, and its mean against something or its proportion against something. And um, it's, there's all sorts of things you can do. Last semester I had um, folks do joint projects where they looked at things like you know, do Auraria students um, follow the health guidelines that the Centers for Disease Control puts out or the FDA puts out of, as far as you know, amount of exercise, amount of fruits and vegetables that they eat. And so they had one population, right, so the Auraria student body, and they were comparing then um, means and proportions to the recommended um, requirements. So recommended fruit, vegetables, and exercise. Um, other, uh, other projects looked at things like comparing, um, actually comparing the sex of a person's pet and comparing that between men and women, right? So two populations and comparing a proportion between them. Right, so at the bottom, these are all the possibilities we're going to be learning about. Um, so your projects should reflect a comparison of means or a comparison of proportions in one or two populations. All right, so that is up there for you to pull down. And with that, we are going to go into our section 7.2. So 7.2 is a confidence interval for the mean um, I, when we don't know sigma, right? So that's pretty realistic. Uh, we generally don't actually have a measure of the variance or standard deviation for the full population. Um, we have to estimate it. And not surprisingly, we're going to estimate it with our sample standard deviation. Okay. Um, so when we did know it, so when sigma was known, um, we had methods in section 7.1, and as long as the population was normal or we had a sample size of at least 30, we were good to go through and use your standard normal table. So it was all section 7.1. If you do not know sigma, um, that's not going to work. Right, so instead, we are going to use what is called a t-distribution. Right, so characteristics of a t-distribution. Let's see. Uh, so it's similar in shape. Uh, the major difference with the t-distribution is that it's a little noisier. Right? So it acknowledges the fact that we don't know sigma and we have to estimate it. Um, so if you look at this dark curve, right, so it's a little more precise. And I say that because if you look at the blue curves, so those are T distributions, they have fatter tails, right? So that's saying that your variation is more spread out, right? So you've got more variability in your, um, dist your sampling distribution. Okay, but it's still bell-shaped, it's still symmetric about the mean. Um, your mean, median, and your mode are still around zero, um, and it's got that same theoretical property that you know a curve never touches the x-axis. You, know, you just get less and less likely to see observations as you go out further and further. Um, one thing um, that you'll notice is so this the fatter tailed one um, has something called a degrees of freedom of five, and that is going to be a gauge of precision. The more precision you have, the higher that number is. And if you notice, so for a T uh, with 20 degrees of freedom, you actually start getting, as you get more and more information, the T distribution looks more and more like your Z. Right? So we'll see that when we start looking at our tables as well. Um, a couple of ways in which it differs, so the variance is greater than 1. Right? So with the standard normal, we had a mean 0 and a variance 1. Um, with a T distribution, it's noisier. It's, it's taking into account the fact that we have more to estimate. Um, it's actually a family of curves, so we're not going to have just one table. It's actually, we're going to have a different distribution for different degrees of freedom. Um, and then, so the curve changes depending on the degrees of freedom. So the smaller that is, the fatter the tails are, um, the larger that gets, the more the tails pull in and start to look like a standard normal. And that's the last point. 
and so that's just a blow up of, of that so you can see that a little bit better um, so a t of five actually with five degrees of freedom is not have does not have a lot of data and so the fat tails are spreading out your variability and acknowledging that whereas 20 degrees of freedom has quite a bit more information and so it's it's getting closer to your standard normal All right so degrees of freedom um, kind of an odd concept. It, it has to do with precision, it has to do with um, the number of values in your sample that are actually free to vary once your statistic has been computed. And so the, the best way for you guys to probably think about this is to think about your mean, um, or instead of your mean, let's think about the sum. Okay, so it's a little, little simpler perhaps. Okay, so if I told you you had five values and I told you that the mean of them um, was 10, okay? well then I would know that if I summed all of those values, well they'd sum up to 50. Right? So the sum of the x divided by my sample size was 10, which means the sum is going to be 50. So degrees of freedom says, well if I know my sum is 50, how many of my observations can change? Well, they can't all change, because if they all change, then that sum is no longer going to be 50. Right? What actually can happen is that four of them can change. So I can take my first four observations, and I can change them however I like. Right? But if my sum is going to be 50, right, then that last observation is completely determined by the fact that the sum is 50, and then I know what my other four observations are. Okay, so that's why it's called degrees of freedom. Right, so given your statistic, how many of your observations can vary? Okay. Um, so for, our, um, for one population, and for the confidence intervals that we're constructing in this section, okay, we just have one mean. And so what that means is that once you calculate it, you can vary all of the observations except for one. Right, so our degrees of freedom are actually going to be n minus 1. So we're going to use that in our formula. And the formula for the confidence interval should look pretty familiar. Um, the differences being, okay, so we have our sample mean plus and minus. Okay, difference, we have a t a critical value instead of a z. We don't have sigma, we have to estimate it. So we're using our sample um, standard deviation. And then we have the same as square root of n. Right? So two big differences. We had to estimate sigma, which means we use our t distribution. Um, table f is where we're going to get those t multipliers. We also wrote it out in the shorthand right here with the plus minus. And then just to you know, d demonstrate that what that means is that you're going to have the lower bound that's found by subtracting this value from x bar and the upper bound that's found by adding that value to x bar. Uh, before we go on to figuring out how to get that t value, so our assumptions for being able to do this is that we have a random sample from the population. Uh, that the population that the sample came from is either, so these are the same assumptions here, um, normal or a sample size that's bigger than or equal to 30. Right, so if you think about it, the only assumption that we're missing here uh, compared to section 7.1 is we don't know sigma. Right, so for a z confidence interval we have three assumptions, for a t confidence interval we have two. All right, so let's look at figuring out our multiplier. Okay, so the t distribution um, is, again, it differs depending on what your degrees of freedom are. So to figure out what your critical value is, you need to start with your confidence level. Right, so let's say I want a 98% confidence level. And then your degrees of freedom. Right, so let's say I had a sample size of 25, that would mean I have 24 degrees of freedom. Okay, so the way you use this table is you look along the top. So confidence interval, I want 98, so I go to the column that says 98. So that is right here. And I need to go down, I need to find the row 
that corresponds to my degrees of freedom. So here I have 24 degrees of freedom. So if I cross those, 98% confidence, 24 degrees of freedom, my critical value is a 2.492. If you happen to be in a situation where your degrees of freedom don't follow in the table, um, go to the closest one that is smaller, right? So if, you know, for some reason 24 wasn't on here, I would go down to 23. So that gives you a, what would be called a conservative approach. Right, so give this one a try. Um, so pause it, see if you can figure out what the T multiplier is for 90% confidence and 17 degrees of freedom. Okay, so let's check what you did. I'm gonna pull open my T table and I asked for, let's see, 90% confidence 17 degrees of freedom. So I'm gonna go to my column that is 90% confidence. So that's this one. And then 17 degrees of freedom, which is this row. So my T critical value is to cross those 90% 17. So my critical value would be 1.74. So that should be your check, 1.74. And the reason, again, you're using a T is if you did not know sigma. And that critical value is going to be a little bit bigger than if you had used your Z distribution. So your confidence intervals are going to be a little bit bigger. All right, so let's construct one. Um, so we've got a sample of six college wrestlers with an average weight of 276 pounds, a sample standard deviation of 12 pounds. Okay, that's a keyword. I gave you the sample standard deviation. That clues you in to the fact that you need to use a T distribution. Um, I'm asking for the 95% confidence interval of the true mean weight of all college wrestlers. And then I'm gonna go a little further and say, um, if a coach claimed that their average weight was 310, um, would your claim be believable? Right, so a couple of things. I haven't said it was normal, but my sample size is not big enough right, to get away with that. So I have how many average? Six college wrestlers average. So for this to be valid, I'm going to have to assume that those weights are normal. So I'm going to add that to my assumptions. Pulling out information, I have X bar, which is 276. I have my sample standard deviation, which is 12. Again, that's S, that is not sigma. Since that is S, I need to know my sample size so I can get my T critical value. So N is six. Uh, degrees of freedom are then N minus one. So degrees of freedom are five. So 95% confidence, five for degrees of freedom. So if I look, so five degrees of freedom and 95% confidence. So my critical value is a 2.571, which is where this came from right here. I'm using my formula, so I've got my X bar, um, plus and minus, so the T critical value I just pulled up, uh, my standard deviation for my sample, so 12, uh, divided by the square root of my sample size. I multiply these three things out, so 2.571 times 12 divided by square root of 6. That is what comes out to be this 12.59528. I'm going to subtract that first from 276. I'm going to round the same precision of my mean. So that's where I get the 263. And then I'm going to add it to the 276, which is where I get the 289. And so this right here is my 95% confidence interval. And so what I can say is that I'm 95% confident that the average weight of a college wrestler is between 263 and 289 pounds. 
So if the coach then claims that the weight of his team, um, the average weight was 310, right, well, that falls outside of our confidence interval. Right? So I would say that that would be hard to believe because it's not consistent with our data. It doesn't match. It's not contained within my confidence interval. Right, so the things in my confidence interval are the, the values that uh, would match with what I would believe would be plausible for a value for my mean. So you can use, a, use that confidence interval to, to think about things like that. All right, um, so give this one a try. It's a little bit harder because now I am having you calculate sample variance. Uh, so this is daily salaries of substitute teachers for eight local school districts. Um, what does the sample mean? Uh, find the 99% confidence interval of the mean for the salaries of substitute teachers in the region. Um, assumptions. So list your assumptions. Uh, fill out the values that you need and give an interpretation. Um, pause. Fill all of that out and then come back and we'll check and see how you did. All right, so hopefully you got an answer that looks like this. Uh, your mean should have come out to be uh, 58 and rounding up would be 58.9. Um, I didn't round it up because I was going to carry it through with calculations here. Uh, standard deviation would look like this. Uh, there are eight observations. Did I get that right? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Uh, which leaves seven degrees of freedom. I wanted a 99% confidence interval, which should have got you to a critical value of 3.499. They put all of that in, and then at the end, I rounded to uh, one more decimal than my data, since I was given the actual data. You should have ended up with a confidence interval of 52.6 to 65.2. And so that would mean that we are 99% confident that the daily salary of a substitute teacher is between $52.6 and $65.2. And assumptions, um, so first of all, that these eight teachers are random, a random sample from the district. And then what else? So we only have eight of them. And the sample size is not big enough to get away with ignoring normality, so we're going to have to assume that those salaries are normally distributed as well. So that would be our assumptions. So in our um, first section of the course, you learn how to calculate your sample variance, and I had put up a video on how to um, actually calculate mean and sample variance. I'm going to put that a link to that video up again, but just as a reminder, you can put this in your calculator to get X bar and S. Right? So knowing where it came from um, is good practice, but uh, knowing how to get that out of your calculator is, is also a convenience, especially once you get to this point. Um, so, Z table, T table, again, the major distinction, if sigma is known, then you, yes, so you use the Z table. If it's not known, you have to use the T table, right, and then you're estimating your sigma. Okay, simple as that. That's the big distinction. So some extra calculator help. Um, entering data, so this is the same video I put up previously in, um, in the semester, so you can link to that if you had not watched it before. So that will teach you how to enter data into your calculator. Right? So this will be necessary for what I'm about to show you, which is how to actually use your calculator to get your confidence interval. Um, it, this particular video also shows you how to do one variable statistics, so that will get your uh, sample standard deviation S, uh, as well as your X bar. So you can test that out by clicking on that link. And just as a reminder, that's also under our videos link on Blackboard, so you can always go there for a quick reference. Uh, using a calculator for confidence intervals um, when your mean is unknown. So you can also do that in your calculator. And uh, 
two ways. So we went through two examples. Uh, the last one, we were given the data, so I had to calculate um, x bar and s. Well, your calculator will just take your data and do the interval for you. Um, same thing for, you can also calculate it directly from your statistics, so your calculator could do that as well. And um, so the video for doing this is linked right here, so that's for when sigma is unknown. Um, so I'm going to encourage you to pause this video and click to that, and that will take you to the YouTube link, so you can learn how to do that in your calculator. And when you are back, um, so also if you want to go back and learn how to do this when sigma is known, um, you can do that in your calculator as well. Um, similarly, you can do it when you have data versus when you have statistics, so when you're given the x bar. And we have previously gone through this uh, reading scores example, so we computed this in class. So this would be a good one for you to use um, to go through, and um, this video will uh, show you how to do that in your calculator. So I'd encourage you to pause this, um, click on the link in your um, lecture notes and open that up, and um, learn how to do it with your calculator. And then finally, uh, a couple of other videos that might be useful for you. Um, if you want to get your t-critical value from your calculator for your confidence interval, uh, there's a video for doing that. And there's also a video for how to get your z-critical value. Um, and again, all of these are under our videos, video links. Um, there's nothing wrong with using the tables, so by all means, if you want to just use the tables, please do so. Um, but if you know you practice a couple of times and you decide, ah, I'm tired of using the table and you want to, you are perfectly free to just do, go directly from your calculator. There's no need for you to actually use the table at all. And that is it. Um, so, uh, let me know if you have questions. Uh, I will be back in town Thursday morning, and like I said, probably we'll have the other lecture up um, Thursday uh, by the end of the day. That is my goal. So, uh, happy YouTube video watching, and good luck with your calculator, and have a great, well, not spring break yet, um, but don't forget quiz six is due, and look for your next video that I will send you an announcement for. And I will see you soon. Bye.